Okay, we are live. Hey, it's January 26th. It's 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and we have uh, as a special guest today, Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Um, most of us are quite familiar with her work. Um, we've, we've, I've communicated with her in the last couple of days to get her to come on for about an hour so we can have a Q&A section. Um, I have about 10 people in here. Um, other people are welcome. I, I sent out invites specifically to people. If you didn't get one specifically, um, it's just an oversight. But if you'd like to join us, please message me on Facebook, Twitter, or G+, and I'll, I'll see about getting a link. Um, and Fiona will be uh, uh, taking questions from the live feed. But anyways, morning, Dr. Schweitzer. Morning. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a huge thing for my channel and the Great Debate community because so many people have been wanting to ask you specifically some questions in regards to your work and get it directly from you rather than secondhand sources. Um, sure. So what we're going to do is I, I'm actually just going to have, like, a, like I said, a Q&A type session. Um, I know Jade wants to start it off with a couple, uh, one or two preliminary questions, if, if that's okay, mm -hmm. and just kind of dive right into it. Okay. Great. Ah, there we go. Yeah, I just uh, had a little trouble unmuting myself, you know, unpredictable these things uh, can be. Well, good morning, Dr. Schweitzer. I'm uh, very glad to hear you here. One of the things I wanted to ask you is that um, having a problem with Felis Interruptus here. Freddie, go! Sorry about that. <laughs> I, it's cats, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you first, um, one of the things we hear from creationists is that when you first made your discovery of soft tissue that, that you were mistreated and you were, you were threatened and you feared for your career and, and that big me, Jack Horner, demanded that you disprove what you found. Um, so what, what I'd like you to do is to, to address that and, you know, what did happen? How were you treated? Did you fear for your career? Uh, was Jack Horner a big meanie? And could you explain how science works and That's that you're funny. supposed to disprove stuff? That's too funny. Um, okay, so uh, no, I never feared for my career because at that point in time I didn't really have one. Um, the first, the first molecular stuff we did, I was a graduate student, and you know, I, I will say that one, one of the best pieces of information, uh, advice I ever got for my career did come from Jack, and he said, "Prove to me they're not." It changes how you do science, it changes how you conduct science, and it points out the value of alternative hypotheses. So, when we first found those little round red things in the bones of Tyrannosaurus rex, when I went to him and finally was found enough courage to go up to my major advisor and say, um, we have these things, um, you know, so they were the right size, they were the right shape, they contained iron, and they were localized to the blood vessels of this animal. Those are the only things I knew, and I went to him and I showed him. Plus, they seem to have nuclei um, of some sort, some kind of difference between the inside and the outside of these little red bodies, which, if they were dinosaurian red blood cells, they would have to have a nucleus. So this is what I showed him, and he said, so what do you think they are? And I said, well, they're in the right size, right shape, right whatever, but they can't be red blood cells. And he said, well, why not? And I said, well, because everyone knows they don't persist over this length of time. And he said, so prove to me they're not. And what that does is it takes my own personal bias out of, well, reduces my own personal bias because I'm trying to disprove my favorite idea. And so rather than trying to prove something in spite of the facts, you try to disprove using data and only data. And if you can't do it, it still stands. That's the thing I think a lot of people don't understand is that it is the role of a scientist to disprove, not to prove. If you're doing science correctly, you are never going to prove anything. That's the job of mathematicians. There is always additional data out there waiting to be discovered that could disprove your pet hypothesis. If you're doing science correctly, that has to be acknowledged in all your work, in my opinion. Well, well, thank you, and I hope that will clear things up for some people. Um, that, you know, you weren't uh, given a hair shirt. It was not the only threat I ever got, or the only times I ever felt threatened or whatever, were actually from emails I got from young Earth creationists. <laughs> well, when 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 uh, Jack Warner was when when he wanted to disprove your work, um, as you were saying, basically, he's. By getting evidence for your hypothesis that it, find out if it's correct or not, you're actually giving evidence that what you're suggesting 
um, was a preservation mechanism could be the actual case, would it not be? Mm-hmm. Yes. Did you have a follow-up, Jade? Oh, yeah. Well, my personally, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you a question going back to your paper on, um, what was it, heme compounds and... Um, uh, in That's a long time and, ago. Well, well, I'm not going to ask, I was going to say, I'm not going to ask anything like really specific because I know you've done a lot of stuff and, and I, I'm sure it'd be pretty easy to bring up some little picky you point from a paper and then you didn't remember it. <laughs> no, well, we... I was, We've learned a lot since that paper, for sure. I mean, oh, that's I know. science built on itself. So, you know, a lot of that stuff, you know, we can either support or not support with newer data. So, Practice Wiser, can we have a brief description, um, basically, uh, of some of your work, um, some of your papers? I guess some of the people in the live feed uh, just kind of wanted a very tertiary um, brief history of some of your publications. Um. <laughs> what what exactly do you want to know? I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not sure how to, how to answer the question, that. The question from the live chat, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it out for you. It's from uh, Trevor, Trevor Lunn. Before we get to PhD level discussion, could Dr. Schweitzer give us, us plebs, a brief lay version of her discoveries? Not all the audience are, are, are um, scientists. So a, a brief lay pers person description of, of your findings. Sure. So basically, when the first dinosaurs, dinosaur bones were being found in the late 1700s, early 1800s, that's not the first time they were found, mind you, but it's kind of when real paleontology began, sort of, kind of. Uh, with approaching these questions with scientific rigor, or what passed for it at that time. But since that time, when we found dinosaur bones, you had reactions. Dinosaur bones are rocks. Dinosaur bones have been completely altered. Dinosaur bones, you know, are not anything we need to pay attention. Somebody planted dinosaur bones in the ground. But eventually, all those things were disproved. And especially when we begin to look at dinosaur bones in the microscope, um, the scientific community realized that bone is bone. Were not altered, some of them, to the degree that people were assuming. So when I came onto the scene, I was um, I was an older student of Jack's. I didn't start my PhD until I was 36. Um, so when I when I started my research project, I was working to prepare a Tyrannosaurus Rex that Jack had just brought back from the field. And I noticed some things, I have a really, really sensitive nose, which can be the bane of my existence. But when I was preparing this dinosaur, it had an odor. And at the time I was teaching, he went cadaver labs. And um, it smelled like one particular cadaver we had in the lab that had died of cancer. And the cancer drugs he had been taking interacted with the embalming fluid to give it a very sweet odor. That's the first thing that came to my mind. So I noticed that, and then I noticed that this bone, the internal parts of the Tyrannosaurus rex bone, looked just like modern horse. I mean, there there was no extra mineralization. It was, it looked like a horse that died about ten years ago and sat out on the prairie. And so I started thinking, well, if it looks this way, maybe maybe there's some tiny remnants of something original there that we can learn more about the animal. And so I was trying to figure out how to do this, and I made this. Um, this slide, I guess, and we saw these little round red things. And that's when Jack said, Mary, this is too big for a master's degree. I want you to switch to a PhD. And so that's what I did. And um, that's when he said, prove to me they're not. And it, it changed everything. It's like prove, pr use data to disprove what you think they are. And in the process, I couldn't. I still can't. I don't know what those red things are because I don't have the data to say. But we've moved on since then and we've looked at other bone. We've used more and more increasingly complex um, methods to study this bone. And what we found is that there seems to be pieces of protein that can only come from vertebrates and it can only come from something that is not a mammal. And we've been able to show this using antibodies, which are complexes that you produce. When you get a cold, you have an antibody against the cold virus, so you can get better. 
we capitalize on the immune system of animals to make antibodies against these proteins, and we use them on our dinosaur tissue. If they bind, and you do all your controls correctly, which is key, you can say with pretty strong confidence that these three and four amino acid epitopes of the original protein are there. And so we've used paleoimmunology for a long time now with a lot of different specimens. And most recently, uh, one of my former graduate students and my current postdoc have been building upon the idea that you can actually sequence these proteins. And that's when they become really usable and you can ask different questions. And so the protein sequence is kind of like the letters in a word. You change one letter, you change the word. And so we can actually track looking at the letters of the proteins we recover to see how closely they are aligned with birds or with crocodiles or with turtles or with humans. And that gives us a whole bunch more information as well. So we've been able to look at um, functions of these organisms, functions of their tissues, when certain unique novelties first arose and begin to ask really cool biological questions with the um, tools of molecular biology. It's kind of exciting to me. And when, what, what was the uh, finding on uh, what actually did allow for the collagen to be lasting for so many years and that the, the, the bonds weren't cleaved in, in that amount of time between, between the... I, uh, with, with collagen, I think the mechanisms of preservation are really different depending upon the tissue type. So with collagen, for example, it has this really unique advantage in that it is tightly complex to mineral. And mineral, it has a great stabilizing effect on biomolecules. So in the process of bone formation, the collagen is laid down by the bone cells and then it is subsequently mineralized and that mineral collagen association gives stability to both. So I think that's part of it. And if you have mineralized protein, as in collagen, it part of the way that, that collagen degrades is it expands. And if it's completely housed in bone, it can't. The second thing is that the bacterial enzymes can't access the protein if it's safely persistent in, um, in bone mineral or surrounded by bone mineral. And so you have a lot of different things coming together that contribute to the preservation of collagen that we see. This is actually the structural, the structural component of, of collagen allowed it to last as long, or one of the conditions. One of the conditions, yeah. And then collagen is a real robust molecule. It kind of hangs out for a long time under normal circumstances. So in bone, it's orders of magnitude more lasting. Did that get your questions, Astro Jade? Well, sorry, I had muted myself. Yeah, that 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 uh, that that got that my second question answered. And uh, the third thing I was just simply going to ask you about, which I think uh, Steve might narrow, is to tell us a little something about osteocytes. Hmm. The osteocytes you found. My favorite cell. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, osteocytes are unique to vertebrates. So if you look at a fungus or a, a moss or a, a worm or a crab, they don't have osteocytes because they don't have bones. So the origin of osteocytes actually goes all the way back to the early Paleozoic when we had the first bony fish show up. Osteocytes look the same whether it's in a Paleozoic fish or in a human. They are, their structure is constrained by their function. So their job as osteoblasts is to secrete collagen and that collagen becomes mineralized. And then when that happens, the cells can't move around freely. They become entrapped in the matrix they secrete, but they still have to function. They have to get rid of waste. They have to get in nutrients. And so that cell changes its shape to send out all kinds of little legs from the body. And those legs form kind of like a bucket brigade. So you have osteocytes close to the vascular channels in bone that dip these little legs into blood vessels to get out the nutrients, so to speak. Um, and then they pass the nutrients on up the chain until it's time for the next one to operate. So they are constrained because of what, what they function like and where they are to have these little legs. They have all osteocytes have elongate bodies with 
bunches of little legs coming off of them. So when we demineralized our T-Rex, that's one of the first things we saw. And my technician at the time said, oh my gosh, I think it's a contaminant. There seems to be a bug in there. And I looked at it and immediately, no, that's an osteocyte. And that has never, you know, soft tissue, transparent, flexible osteocytes have never been considered to be possible. Although there was some hints as early as 1966 from a Polish colleague that we might indeed find these someday. So if you have the cell and it's a vertebrate cell, you should have a nucleus and you should have potentially DNA. But with okay, osteocytes, so they're so um, they're so unique that osteocytes actually produce some proteins that only osteocytes of birds produce, for example. And we were able to I just ask a question, please? You gave a date <laughs> there. Uh, I missed the date of your Polish colleague. 1966, Roman philosophy. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that interruption. No, no worries. Now, you, you were saying before that you said something about antibodies that were specifically um, binding to the DNA and the osteocytes. Yes. Um, could you could, uh, talk about that a little bit more and maybe explain to the, um, the less biological among us uh, the difference between an osteoblast, osteo, osteoclast, and maybe an osteocyte so people kind of uh -huh. know a little bit what they're what, what they're uh, in regards to? Yes. An osteoblast is a fat little cell that sits on the edges of tissue and chunks out collagen. And as it, as it begins to um, mature, it moves deeper into the tissue and becomes constrained by, um, by the mineral, like I said, um, and becomes an osteocyte. So an osteocyte is a grown-up osteoblast. And then an osteoclast is not even in the same cell lineage, but it is named for its function. It's the bone eater. Osteo means bone, clast means to eat. So these are cells that are actually part of the immune system that eat bone, and you need that. So for example, if you're a couch potato and you decide that you're going to start lifting weights, your bone has to strengthen to accommodate the added stress. So your osteoblasts go into action and your bone gets thicker and a little bit more dense, which is why exercise is a really good thing for osteoporosis. But suppose that you do something completely different with your bone than you normally do your muscles are going to change orientation slightly, and that's where your osteoclasts come in. They have to get rid of the bone that's no longer needed so the osteoblast can lay it down in the right shape. I, I think what we might do later on, if people are, are interested, uh, if Fiona and Jade want to do it, um, we might have a little like secondary hangout sometime um, to explain some of these more biological terms if people are interested. i got to get to Jack because Jack is actually leaving for class here soon, but I know he had a few questions to get in, so I was going to get in real quick. Jack, go ahead and ask your question because I know, like I said, you're on a tight schedule. Oh, okay. All right. Um, hi, Doctor. Is it Schweitzer? Schweitzer. Okay. Um, this is a simple question, but it requires a little bit of a background. So um, it's about your most recent paper, uh, the one that was published uh, the 23rd, I think. Just a couple um, days ago, yeah. Yeah. So uh, a friend of mine here uh, on Google+, Plus, uh, Young Earth Creationist, he posted the article, um, or posted a, a science, science magazine uh, article talking about your paper. Um, and the title of the paper was, or title of the article was like 80 million year old fossil confirmed to have collagen, something like that. Um, and so I guess... Uh, his impression from that and, and the impression that that article gave it, um, made it seem like your paper would be like discussing, really discussing uh, the age of the fossil a lot, the, the 80 million years old. And um, I guess the article wanted to give an eye-catching headline, you know, it sounds nice. Um, and so there's a couple of young earth creationists who commented on, on his thread and saying, oh, 80 million years, that's, that's ridiculous, that's crazy, and like laughing at it. And so I decided to uh, to look at the paper. I, I go to Texas A&M, and so I can use my I, I can find the paper and, and have access to it and stuff. So I went and read the paper, and uh, didn't see anything about the ages. So I looked at the citations for that. Went on a citation hunt uh, to try to find uh, where it talked about the actual dating of it. Because um, and through that, I I saw that uh, that wasn't really the the focus of your paper, and has not really the focus <laughs> of any of your papers. Yeah, and but that's the impression that sometimes these uh, articles give is that 
you know. Um, so I, I was wondering, um, where did you get the, uh, the dates for the T-Rex and the Brachylophosaurus canadensis fossils? Um, we have a person who uh, does geology in here to paleontology, uh, paleontology, not geology, uh, Bill, right? Uh, he was talking about the KT boundary. I've forgotten about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess, is there um, any specific papers in, in the literature or anything you could point to that show the, the, A, the H, uh, the dating of those specific fossils? Um, yeah, there are. It's, I don't mention it because it's not my area of expertise. It's, there's, it's well, well documented, and I don't need to reinvent the wheel. But um, Greg, oh, I can't remember his last name. Um, if you look at Hell Creek Formation, age or Hell Creek formation dating, Judith River formation, you'll, you'll see the papers, the geology behind why they say what they say. So the Hell Creek is about the last three million years of the age of the dinosaurs. It, it, it is um, deposited during a time when the Mesozoic ends and the Cenozoic begins. So it is divided from the um, later, t later sediments by the KT boundary which in Montana is um, spectacularly visible in the parts of the country that we look at. You can go up and put your finger on it. It's kind of cool. Um, so you never, ever, ever find a whole articulated T-Rex above that boundary. You find a lot of other things, but you don't find T-Rexes, which is one of the reasons we say that's when they went, dinosaurs went extinct. But it can be dated in a couple different ways. The most common way for dinosaur growing sediments to be dated is what we call relative dating. A relative dating is grounded by absolute dating if you have any kind of volcanic activity. So where I work, there's an, uh, a lot of mountain building activity at the time of the dinosaurs. So we do have um, seams of, of um, volcanic material and ash that can be dated absolutely. So we use absolute dating to bracket the youngest and oldest potential times for the sediments that bear our fossils. And then we use relative dating techniques within that bracket to figure out exactly where it lies. OK. Um, so you said that the absolute uh was with the volcanic activity or things like that. What was the relative dating, though? Well, absolute dating is based upon radiometric decay. So, okay. it's, you know, it's physics. It's inviolable. It is one of those laws that's really hard to get around. Um, stratigraphic mm -hmm. dating or relative dating is if you find, if you have a layer that only contains clams, for example, and you go up a little bit, and you have a layer that only contains trees. And you go up a little bit further, and you have a layer that only contains dinosaurs. Then you can say, OK, unless you invoke the reversal of physics, the clams are older than the trees, and the trees are older than the dinosaurs. That's relative data. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, uh, that, that clears my question. Or just one more thing for, for the absolute dating. Do you all use, uh, I guess, mass, mass spec? Or you, all, you wouldn't do that, but the people who are dating that absolutely would use mass spec, I suppose. Um, that's, that's one of the common methods, yes. Okay. There's all kinds of different ways that you can get at that. Um, and all radiometric dating is not equivalent. So I get a lot of people saying, well, why haven't you done carbon-14 dating? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I did that. You know, there's a reason for that. And so, you know, I, I, I guess you have to be certain that the isotopes you're looking at are appropriate for the questions you are asking. Right. It is interesting in the note that uh, the, the rates program that the Young Earth Creationist had, um, all of them actually agreed that the isometric, uh, excuse me, the isochron dating methods did indicate an, an, an old Earth um, and that the physics was correct, except that they were trying to find a way to say that decay constants had changed. But they, they did acknowledge that these dates are accurate within the framework of the science that we know to be the case, you know, as, as now. So I wanted to point that out that... He, that bugs me. Why would God try to trick us? That's a question I mean, we've asked them before. Why that's would, really what? demeaning. It's like, okay, we're going to give you a brain and we're going to make a, a world of order. Because order is something God's known for. 
rational, he's consistent. So we're going to make this world of order and then, wow, we're going to trick you by saying that all the, the rules that you can figure out with your brain no longer apply. But I just, I don't buy that. God's not the deceiver in this. And I think that young earth creationists have to be really, really careful when they sit there and try to manipulate the data to support their worldview. That is not science. I, we, I think we, everybody in this hangout agrees with that 100%. I've noticed there's two, two camps, and I'm, I'm going to get to hogtie real quick. I think there's two camps, though. One of the, one of the types of creations that we deal with, they're the ones that, that don't recognize the data. They, they say the data doesn't indicate you know, old Earth. And the other ones that say that, yes, the data does, but they're trying to come up with science that kind of changes the laws of physics as we know it to try to uh, explain the data. So there are ty two different types of, of creation yeah. out there that do Oh, that. there's more than two, yes. That, that, I'm being very, I, very broad in, in umbrella yeah. terms. Yeah, if I wanted to mention, Steve, uh, Heavy Holler uh, pointed it out too. It's my one of my favorite statements is that I don't believe in a trickster god. Yeah, I if agree. I, if yeah, I wanted I a trickster you. god, I'd go to Loki. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, can't imagine a deity that would make all the evidence point to a, an old earth, have a consilience across the board of many, many different types of, of isochron dating methods, and then say, oh, I'm just trying to trick you. That makes no sense to me whatsoever to have a deity like that. But anyways, Hogtie, uh, we, we want to make it home because I, I want to fit you in here. Um, I just want to say goodbye real quick. This. I'm sorry, what, Jack? I just want to say goodbye real quick, and uh, congratulations on the, uh, the re repeat of the uh, uh, collagen experiment, the paper. It was fun. My my postdoc did did all the work, so I can't take much credit. <laughs> all right, bye, y'all. Yeah, the, the Brachylophosaurus uh, discovery is exciting. It's, it's neat stuff. Um, unfortunately, I got um, I have two questions, and, and I'm going to have to, if you don't mind, I'm going to drag you in the wayback machine here because what what we're faced with online here when when we you know want evidence, we want facts. Well, they're going to the the creationists will often throw up um, a, a BBC um, web article that was posted in 2005. Now, apparently this is based on an interview you had given with um, Science in Motion, or Science in Action, rather, in 2005. I, I don't remember, probably. That was yeah. a really, really <laughs> bad time for me, so. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it, it's, it's funny how, how a scientist's uh, footprint can, can be made by people other than, than that scientist who's actually doing the investigation. But, but this is where you had, you had discussed um, things like you said that, that there's, there's the appearance of these red blood cells. And as, as you very clearly described in here, you're saying that you were looking at these things with a microscope and this is, but you didn't make the declaration, well, look, we found these red blood cells. Well, of course, we're hearing that, um, oh yeah, no, they found, I mean, they're saying like viable proteins. They use terms like that, viable proteins. And, and uh, the, I think the first question I want to ask, pardon me, <coughs> has to do with um, uh, what's meant by, by fossilization. Because as you read the, the BBC rewrite up of your interview on on uh, on science in action um it it sort of tugs at the the layman's understanding or perhaps misunderstanding of what's meant by fossilization and and i'll say it this way not being a paleontologist you know i i live fairly close to uh to the royal Tyrrell museum and and you can on your way there you might see a, a deer that had dropped dead and there's bones right and you look at it and those are bones and then when you go to the museum there are rocks that are bone shaped and they will tell you well those are fossils so there's a thing that's a fossil and a thing that's a bone. But they're nothing. not rocks. <laughs> well, so that's, that's a fallacy. They're not rocks at all. Just slice well, one up and stick it under your microscope. There isn't a rock on the planet that looks like that. They don't let me touch them. They, they <laughs> <laughs> everything's under glass in there. Um, actually, I do have a chance for, for a tour with the director, which would be kind of interesting. But, but um, I guess, can you... Um, yeah, what I'm asking here is that regarding this stuff in, in 2005 and, and how it was presented in the public, it, it sounds like that there was this amazing rethinking and revision that, that happened about the nature of what is meant by the word fossil. Can you maybe help us out a little bit in, in terms of how the word fossil is used and, and whether or not this was sort of an earth shattering um, find to find that there's actually, you know, you say there's maybe, you know, amino acids, protein segments, um, what, what is meant, help, help the layman understand here, what is meant by fossilization and what is a fossil? Uh, nobody knows. <laughs> so, what I can tell you is that traditionally a fossil is any evidence of past life. So it can be a petrified tree, it can be a microbe entrapped in its own mess that's mineralized, it can be a dinosaur bone, it can be, you name it. If, if it is, it can be a trackway, it can be a worm print, it can be anything that testifies that life was once there. So that is the meaning of the term fossil. 
it's co-opted meaning, which never really is discussed, is that when a fossil forms, you got the animal, you got the skin, you got the muscles, you got the guts, you got everything else, all the proteins, all the DNA, all the cells, when it dies. Gradually over time, it becomes buried before or after all those soft tissues degrade, and that determines the state of your fossil. But you know this, if you hold meatloaf too long in your refrigerator, you got the beginnings of degradation right there. You can see it. So I, ge I guess that's where this idea came from, that proteins can't persist. But the idea is when all of the soft tissues and all of the original proteins degrade away, they then get buried. And when they're buried, rocks sitting above it contain minerals that dissolve and then are redeposited in the spaces of the bone, where the bone cells sat, where the blood vessels sit, and the bone becomes dense and it becomes hard. So that is kind of what we think of when we think of a fossil, is not a bone turned to rock, but a bone that's been infiltrated with secondary minerals. If you look at the bones of dinosaurs under the microscope, they look just like your bone. They just have a few extra minerals in them in the places where there were spaces. So what it means to be a fossil, it simply is evidence of past life. Poop. We have fossilized poop. That's, that's a fossil. What it means for fossilization is it is a, a process by which things go from the biosphere or that part of the world that supports living organisms to the geosphere or the rock record. And that can happen in about a billion different ways. It, and so it depends upon what you mean. And that's about the best I can, I can do. I mean, feathers fossilize differently than bone fossilizes, and that fossilizes differently than skin, and we have all of them in the rock record. I don't know if that helps any. It, it does. It's, it's a great answer, and, and it helps address the, the this thing we've been arguing about, is that, is that when, they, when they talk about uh, some of your finds, of course, they're referring to the, to the 2005 discussion of the of the T Rex, um, that you know they're they're saying well this thing wasn't fossilized like this thing's they say it's been around for 68 million years but but it hasn't fossilized and we tell them well no that's that is a fossil that's um, I mean the issue in terms of of what chemical processes have gone on and minerals filling in spaces and things like that well that's the, the, you know that's the devil's in the details of course but um, so I, I, if I can I think it's a great answer and it's it's helpful I think we'll. Some of us will have to sort of we'll retread that in conversations when it when when these guys continue to bring it up because they always bring up the same old stuff. Yeah. So th this leads well, to my well, they're right in one sense ahead. in that nor like if I if I show you a two medicine formation bone, so this is the equivalent age of our Brachylophosaurus, but it's from a different part of Montana. You will see that bone completely. Um, what's the word I want? Secondarily mineralized. So it, it's discolored and it's every single available space is filled with hard mineral. And like I said, nobody really uses the term fossilization correctly, but if you are going to use it in the common vernacular, that bone represents fossilized bone. That's not, you know, I mean, that's inaccurate, but that's what people think of when they think of fossilized bone, they think of that. And in that sense, and in that sense only, our T-Rex was not. The open spaces in the T-Rex were open spaces. There was no secondary mineralization. It was lacy. It was light. Um, it was unaltered. And I could hold a piece of it in my hand and put it next to the piece of terrecular bone from a horse, and you couldn't tell the difference. So in one sense, it wasn't fossilized in the classic sense of being completely remineralized the way that a lot of bone is. It was weird. So it's really so, depending on how, how people are going to be using the word it, Exactly, exactly. And that's one of the things I drive my students crazy on is words count. Words what, are important. Use what, your words carefully. But it wasn't like huge chunks of actual bone that didn't have any kind of permeabilization or anything between the, the bone matrix or anything like that. Correct. Well, define huge. <laughs> um, several centimeters? <laughs> it was. Was it several centimeters? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's something that I wasn't aware of. Um, well, in some of my earlier papers, I've actually got pictures of it. The 1997 JVP paper, we show, we show that, exactly. Does that, does that answer your question, Octavio? Yeah, it does, it does. And it kind of <clears throat> nicely kind of leads into the second one because I, you know, I sort of, 
Um, I guess what, what I'm wondering about, and I kind of think I know the answer to this one, but I, I want to hear you say it out loud. Um, when these things come up, and you know that people are still discussing this thing from 2005, um, <clears throat> and now with this recent uh, Brachiosaurus, um, they're going to start up on, um, uh, Bra sorry, Brachylophosaurus, I got the wrong creature there. Um, you know, they're, they're now going to start speculating about that stuff. Um, you, you hear about these things, and you even get contacted directly by them. Um, <clears throat> my question is, is as a, as a, as a scientist, um, why do you not invest a, a bunch of time in the public eye and, um, <clears throat> you know, setting up Google Hangouts with creationists and, and, and setting them straight? Uh, That's a job, softball question. There you go. My job is to do the research, to gather data, to present the evidence for a hypothesis. I am a scientist. I... When I wear my science hat, I don't have beliefs. I have only data. It's very boring. Data can only do two things. It can either support or fail to support or disprove. I guess that's three. And I think that's so the true that's science position. Yeah. Well, this this is something we, we hear quite a bit. Is it, is it when um, you know a creationist puts up a blog somewhere, does a YouTube video? Um, over time, there'll be this response of like, um, like one of the things we've been discussing in this community is uh, you might be uh, I'm sure you'd be aware of this the that human chromosome number two is is likely a result of a fusion of two ancient ape uh, chromosomes. And um, there are, you know, PhD holding people that, you know, work at, at the at ICR who write about this stuff. And, and one of the things that's thrown in our face quite a bit is, <clears throat> well, gee, you know, the scientific community hasn't responded to it. You know, they, they can't respond to these things, right? They, they're just like, they're so baffled by this, this brilliant writing by the folks at ICR that they're all, they're all hiding under the blankets, um, unable to address these things. And, and I suspect, um, having practiced in that area, that, um, that, there, there's a different reason why scientists are unable to address um, these these concerns that come up about their work. And, and I mean, you went with not my job. I, I was I was expecting you to say there just literally aren't enough hours in a day. Like you're you're under a lot of pressure for career development, and and you have obligations to your institution and your students. And the idea of you know doing what we do, sit in Google Hangouts and discuss these things um, for you know we really appreciate your time today for sure. But but is this going to be how science is dealt with by you know, arguing with individual creationists with their web pages. I can't. I'm sorry, but I can't. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of my energy. And I think it does not honor God to go down that road and um, follow that lineage. It's not important. If these guys would take half the energy that they spend trying to prove that the world is young and use it to change the world around them, feed the hungry, take care of the kids, get the cats off the street, anything, that our world would be so much better, but they waste so much time and energy and effort on disproving that the world is old. It's not a salvation issue. Get over it. That is such a wonderful answer. Yeah, and you're touching on one of my pet peeves too, is that, they, that most of the people who are invested in that enterprise, and that is convincing people that the earth is quite young, um, are not at all invested in in spreading the gospel message. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm going to be, I, I'm not all that interested in that. I'm not really that motivated to see that the gospel message is, is spread effectively, but I'm, I'm more invested in seeing the, the scientific enterprise proceed. And I think that having... Great. It, and, and exactly what you were just saying. I mean, we say we don't have time. It's not your job. You know, I think that that dealing with people who aren't listening anyway um, doesn't advance the the scientific enterprise. So um, I, I really like your attitude to the to the whole thing. Yeah, I I just you know I get really frustrated sometimes because there's so many things that are so much more important than this, and it's like they're 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 stubbing their toe on a toenail. And there's so many things that this energy could be used to a greater good. And I think, again, tripping on this stupid little issue does not in any way honor God. What are they trying to do? I, it, it bugs me. Uh, it really bugs me because it's a huge waste. Do you think they're putting their own personal ideological beliefs ahead of, you know, um, of anything else? That they want it, they want this to be true so much that they they're just unwilling to actually examine things, um, intellectually speaking. And be well, it's, it's, a it's a bias, and the scientific community has plenty of biases. Believe me. So, um, and I I can think of many 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 in my own field, including the bias that original molecules don't persist in fossils. So everybody has bias. We're human, and we the biases arise out of our own experiences. The bias so. bias can be changed with data. Bias, if you are a, an honest scientist, bias is always changed with data. 
but you ask the hard question. And, and see, for me, when people say, don't you get upset when your scientific community says this kind of stuff about you? And I'm like, no, that is their job. And you know, there's always scientists out there, trust me, who are a lot smarter than me, who think about things that I don't think about. And maybe I miss something. That's their job. And so they keep me honest. They keep me disciplined. They keep me hardworking. Um, but in the end, if my data is good enough, are good enough, if my data are rigorous enough, if my data are repeatable enough, they can have their minds changed. And that is science. It isn't faith. That's science. Absolutely. When I wear my science hat, I don't have beliefs. I have only data. Right, yeah, I think the, the, the people we're talking about just really don't understand the, the battleground that you're describing. It's, it's a great enterprise. And I, I have about 11 more questions, but I've got to be respectful of other people in the room and, and uh, Dr. Schweitzer's time. So uh, I, I'm going to yield. <laughs> but, we're going uh, to get about a few more people in real quick. Um, I, I know I'm going to have to get off in about five minutes. i got a whole bunch of stuff waiting on me. So. Okay. Um, I, I have to make a decision between Bill and Paul. Um, Paul, actually, I, Bill, I'm going to have to like wait on you. Paul has been waiting a lot longer. I know Paul has videos out. So, Paul, you had some very specific questions to ask Mary. Uh, can can you um, go ahead and, and ask sure I'll try and, and and keep them keep them quick. Um, so I was recently in a Young Earth seminar where your research was used to support claims um, that working blood vessels, fresh blood cells, and intact DNA had been found in dinosaur cells or dinosaur fossils. Um, is that a fair characterization of your research? <laughs> it's wrong on all counts. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, and then I guess the second one, which which was. Uh, asked DNA, quite a bit. What has to do with words? What do they mean by fresh DNA? Well, I, I, it was my impression that, you know, that they were trying to give the impression of, you know, basically a T-Rex with a steak in their mouth kind of a thing. But, <laughs> no. <laughs> They're working you know, blood I mean, vessels, that's great. Well, Paul, if I can read something real quick. I, I, doc, Dr. Rana sent you the same book I, uh, he sent me. It's called Dinosaur's Blood in the Age of the Earth. And by the way, it's very, really good. It's short, it's succinct, but it's very informative. And I just read a, a, a small sentence out um, in regards to that. I don't think... You would mind and see if she agrees with it because it goes right up along with you what you're talking about paul it says quote schweitzer and her fellow researchers did not discover blood cell blood vessels but chemically transformed chemically cross-linked structures derived from original blood cells yet still retaining their original shape would that be appropriate um it, it depends on how you define it what is a blood vessel how do you characterize a blood vessel? How do we know what we have? So if a blood vessel is made up of endothelial cells, if a blood vessel is, I mean, we've got, we know how to recognize modern blood vessels. Is it different? Yes, it's different. Our blood vessels all have iron in the vessel walls, and we have to get rid of that iron to get the data out of it. But um, functionally, structurally, morphologically, you can't tell our dinosaur vessels apart from vessels studied similarly that are recent. So what do you mean? It's the same thing with fresh DNA. What do you mean by that? Because we do have very rigorous evidence for DNA as the chemical in our dinosaur bone. And furthermore, it localizes using chemical methods to these osteocytes where you would expect it to be. But can I say it's dinosaur DNA? No, I can't because it can be anything else on the planet unless I have sequence. And sequencing the DNA we pull out of our bones has so far proven to be impossible. So can I say I've got DNA in my bones? Yes. Can I say whose it is? No. I mean, I can't say yes. I can say the data support the presence of DNA using four different lines of chemical evidence. Does it say whose DNA it is? No. And that's what I mean. Words are really, really important. Do we have blood cells? No, we do not have blood cells. I don't have the data to support that. We have round red structures that localize to the blood vessel channels. They have the morphological characteristics of blood vessels. They have a chemical makeup similar to what you'd expect blood vessels to have, blood cells to have. And I've never figured out why people are more focused on these little red blood cells than they are on the osteocytes, which are way cooler. <laughs> Well, even oh. if, yeah, because even if they even if they were really intact, you know, we had blood cells and we had blood vessels. That that doesn't change anything, correct? I mean, that doesn't yeah. change our understanding of how, the age of the earth. It only changes our understanding of how things are fossilized, correct? Yes, exactly. And the cool thing of it is, if we if we quit wasting time on how old these things are and start getting at why are they there, it has huge implications that go far beyond dinosaurs. And that's that's what kind of drives me is okay. So these things persist in dinosaur bone. How come? 
What can we learn from that? That's actually a question that, that somebody in the live chat asked, and I hoped we would get to this. And it was from Mike Duffy, and he asked, how much did this discovery change the way scientists thought about how things can be or are preserved? Scientists don't change their mind easily. So we, you know, it's been over 10 years since we announced these soft tissues, and we still got a large contingent of the scientific community that doesn't buy it. But as more and more people apply these methods, they see that there's a lot of dinosaur bone out there that has soft tissues that are still soft, that are still flexible. So I would say right away, the scientific community, not the young earth community, had the very appropriate response, which is total skepticism. I'm going to wait and see what the data say. And they required enormous and rigorous data, as they should. This is something that was not expected. And it, you know, so, so what we've concentrated on is producing more and more evidence that these things belong to the dinosaur, but also asking uh, alternative questions. Why? What is it that allows this kind of preservation? Can we address it? So for one thing, we know how fast, say, embryonic skin degrades. It takes about two weeks unless you have extenuating circumstances like mummification. Because embryonic skin is really, really thin, but it's, well, in my case, it's usually inside the eggshells, which complicates things. So if it, if it degrades completely within two weeks, that gives us a window that we can start experimenting with it. Well, the skin lasts longer if it's buried in sand versus mud. Does it last longer when it's in the presence of microbes or not? Does it last longer when it's oxidizing versus reducing? These are all conditions we can play with and then we can get at experimentally, get at how things are preserved early in diagenesis so that they might persist into the rock record. And it has to happen within those two week windows. And when you think about that, it's, it's very amenable to experimentation. What stabilizes tissues? I mean, there's not, there wasn't anybody around just put formaldehyde all over these dinosaurs. So, it has to be a natural process, and we can actually ask those questions when we start looking closely at how these are preserved and why. That's funny because there's actually a guy in our community who, a young earth creationist, so I think he's suggesting that what you should be doing is an experiment. I'm probably characterizing it poorly, but something like throw a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken in the forest somewhere. Um, I apologize. That's sort of an inside joke amongst the rest of us. but. Well, we've actually done something kind of similar. We didn't use Kentucky Fried Chicken, but you know, a lot of our papers deal with exactly that. Uh, there's there's a researcher out there who says those aren't blood vessels, those are biofilm. So we went and tested that idea, and we can tell you definitively that those are not biofilm; they are blood vessels. And we did it through experimentations, just like you said. So um, you know, right now we're we're looking. We have a project going on where we're looking at all the conditions that might exist to preserve feathers, and how long does it take for them to stabilize? And what we're finding is pretty darn cool. So you know, it's not. It's not this big cloudy mystery that scientists are just sitting in their lab trying to figure out how to confuse and, and I don't know, destroy Christian faith. I am a Christian. I love the Lord. And I have absolutely, I, I, my God has gotten so much bigger the bigger I study science. I mean, it's just it's really, really amazing. And I don't want to waste time on other, other issues like how old is the earth. I mean, really, who cares? And I think that's a brilliant way to kind of uh, bring this to a close. I know, you know, you said you had to go yeah. quickly. Um, I, we do appreciate very much you coming in and answering these questions and talking to us about it. It's been a huge thing in our community for quite some time. And I think this really will put to rest a lot of the, uh, the, the questions that uh, some of the people that come in and, you know, try to um, take your work and change some of the things that you've actually said. And I think this sets the record straight. Um, I'm glad we didn't get too technical. I, I, I didn't want to like lose a lot of people, but do it just technical enough to buy, it'd be interesting. And of course, we'll probably have another hangout later on to talk some more about some of the more technical aspects with a few people. But Dr. Schweitzer, I wanted to thank you very much for coming in. Um, this was amazing. Um, this is the highlight of, of uh, my channel so far. Is there anything you want to leave us with, um, with your faith or anything you want to discuss real quick before we, I end the hangout? Yeah, tell, tell your listeners to go and do this experiment. Take a chicken leg with skin, with claws, with tissue, and bury it in a fine-grained sand and mud, and tell me which one degrades faster. That would be really useful for me, and it might teach them something. Well, there we go. 
And I, I hope you enjoy this very much. Listeners, thank you much um, for joining us. Um, all the people that are supporting my channel, the patrons, and the people that join the Hangouts to have these engaging conversations. I hope this year will continue on to have great entertainment. Um, you guys have been really amazing for everything that you've done to support my channel. And you, you guys, the reasons why I try to get these kind of brilliant guests in here to talk about um, types of science and uh, just educate people. But that, I'm going to close the Hangout out. And again, we might have an after Hangout if people want to stick around afterwards to discuss some of the things we discussed in here today. But thank you, very, Dr. Schweitzer, very much. And I'm ending the Hangout.